Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And this month, as I am each and every month, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Craig Joseph. He is the Chief Medical Officer at Nordic Consulting. Craig, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me once again. As we do each and every month, we're talking about the latest news you can use. Uh, This is for the month of uh, June 2023. And um, fair few things have happened. Um, Chat GPT continues to trend. Feels like the COVID-19 replacement, although COVID-19 has got some uh, issues going on in terms of uh, vaccines. And uh, my goodness, Robert Kennedy is uh, continuing to spout his anti-vaccine content. Uh, top 11 uh, negative uh, vaccine performers uh, in, in the world, I believe, in that uh, collection. Um, I, what's going on from your perspective? Uh, besides vaccine misinformation, um Chat GPT continues to uh, avoid being a hype and seems to continue to to impress and to um, you know to really create uh, material that that is helpful. Um, it was interesting. I think uh, last month uh, a lawyer got into a little bit of trouble. This is outside of healthcare, but uh, uh, clearly you're familiar with this. He uh, so he he researched. That's I'm I'm putting in air quotes. He researched. Uh, a case on oh you come uh, up with the best phrases uh, on chat gpt <laughs> and uh, chat gpt gave him a very uh excellent um <laughs> uh thesis or i don't know whatever it was but it was in you know legal speak legalese and it was great and he submitted it and it turned out it was all of course made up and mm. um the cases that it cited did not exist and the uh, the law that it referenced uh was not real and um the judge was not happy uh, and, and so, again, um, you know, it's important, I think, when we talk about this generative AI that it continue to, to, you know, shake everyone up with the fact that, hey, this stuff uh, hallucinates pretty regularly. And it's not at the point where it can be trusted in terms of facts. Uh, and if you're using it that way, then you're, you're, you're cruising for a bruising. However, if you're using it to get a first draft of something done, or if you're using it to point in a direction, or if you've got writer's block and you're using it from that standpoint, it's it's excellent. If you're using it with something that you've already written to say, hey, can you make this sound more authoritative? Or can you add uh, some emotional IQ points to this? Or how would I add emotional IQ to uh, to my writing? Um, it, it's, it's great. And so again, um, I think as it starts to get more focused, we're going to see even even greater things from it. That that's what's so astounding to me. Right now, most of us are just using this plain vanilla version. It hasn't been. It has no guardrails have been placed upon it. No um, specific personal information is there in general, and so it can't really um, you know reason or or write like uh, us, uh, a specific user. And still, it does all of these amazing things. So I'm, I continue to be, uh, to be wowed by it. I continue to pay twenty dollars a month to have access to the uh, the faster, uh, newer, more up to date uh, version of it. Um, and and I'm, I think the sky is really, really the limit. I don't believe that physicians will be um, uh, made obsolete. Um, I do believe that physicians who don't use uh, these sorts of AIs will be made obsolete, actually. And so it'll just be another tool. It's like a physician who says, well, I'm not going to use a stethoscope. A stethoscope. I'm just going to put my ear up to the patient's chest. Yeah, well, guess what? Your exam is not going to be as good as mine. And, uh, and you're in trouble. And so if, as long as you're using, you know how to use the tool, the stethoscope is not a good reflex hammer, Dr. Nick even though I've seen people use it before that way. Um, if you use the tool appropriately, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you and your patient. You, you know, it's, it, you talk about putting your ear up to the chest. Just to be clear, that actually used to happen. That was the uh, precursor, although I think they had the uh, Tim, uh, the, the sort of um, 
uh, cone-shaped device that's helped the pinard that we used in uh, obstetrics for years. So um, not as bizarre as it sounds, uh, putting your ear up to the chest. And of course, that was an advancement. As for chat GPT, um, I, I concur, um, although it does raise some challenges. And, you know, you've highlighted one. I, I've got to wonder what's happening with that uh, particular uh, lawyer and what the consequences of that are, apart from, you know, some bad PR. Does it all sort of just disappear in the uh, morass of information that gets uh, uh, published? Um what we're seeing is uh, something that uh, a marketing uh, individual that I follow by the name of Mark Schaefer, uh, he's published a number of books, does a really good job. Um, I think he's, you know, quite thoughtful about his content. And, you know, he talks about this in terms of his his book from a few years pre the chat GPT content shock and the fact that we've got so much content you can't focus now on producing content from a marketing standpoint. Um, and he, he cited a number of data points that I think are just really astounding when you think about this from a chat GPT uh, standpoint. Um, one of the science fiction magazines is now stopping taking submissions. They've received so many AI generated stories <laughs> that it's just no enough. We're not taking any more submissions, which you know, from an author's standpoint, uh, a little bit challenging. Amazon has a direct publishing uh, capability, and it's currently so swamped, and there has been such a massive increase in self-publishing books that they've increased the cost for this whole process uh, to try and stem the uh, tide. Um, one author has written um, a massive, uh, well, it's not massive, but a novel, in a day, and said he was going to write 300 books a year. <laughs> Just, but who's going to read them? Yeah, that one that knows that question, clearly. But, you, you know, the point is that there's huge amounts of content and our ability to sort of tease out. And I think you eloquently described this is not a replacement. It's a tool that we use. And, you know, those people that understand that become the chat GPT whisperers. I actually saw a paper this uh, past couple of weeks that talked about this, where they not only described the production of content, but also described how they proposed the question. This was actually, it was in the Gregory House um, uh, committee uh, process that has a longstanding uh, history of, you know, unfolding the data about a patient who has a rare disease. And they did the same thing with chat GPT, um, which was way more successful uh, than, you know, the typical uh, clinician who gets around 20%. In this particular instance, chat GPT was scoring 40. And, you know, the uh, premise or the position that they took was, gosh, we should jump on this as quickly as possible with the appropriate guardrails. What I found most interesting was the detailed prompting that they used to put in guardrails for chat GPT to say, this is what this is. And, you know, in the top differential that it came out with, it was astoundingly good. 40% might not sound great, but when you compare it to 20, that's already a doubling. Um, So I I think, you know, the addition is where we have the opportunity. And um, I, I was fortunate. I was actually at AI uh, med in uh, San Diego. And, you know, there was a lot of buzz, a lot of excitement, uh, an awful lot of presentations. I didn't hear a lot of negativity. And that was healthcare focused. AI med's been around. Uh, Anthony Chang has, you know, been pushing this particular conference concept for years, long, long before. And you know, I think is going to ride the wave um, of interest. Uh, certainly a conference that I'm excited to continue to attend and participate in um, based on what was happening. Wait, let me be clear. Um, you didn't hear uh, concerns about AI at a conference called AI Med. <laughs> we, 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 oh, we, no bias were there at all. expecting <laughs> that, Dr. Nick? <laughs> Okay, smarty pants. Yes, that's a fair comment. <laughs> but, you know, normally there's somebody bouncing around that's going to say no, no, no. But uh, 
I didn't hear much of that um, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, we pre-selected the people that were there, but ah, yes, it was very positive from my experience. So I, I think all good. And, you know, I continue to use it on the cheap side. I think the disappointment I had when I tried to jump on your paid subscription was it it still didn't seem to add the chat GPT four piece that I understood was you could add in more content, uh, more words. I forget what the limit is that we have in the uh, free version, but I thought it was expanded. That didn't seem to be the case, unfortunately. So I was disappointed with that. I've got to be honest. Yes, same. I'm not sure how people are getting around it. I, I think there are ways to get around it by giving it multiple prompts and um, but I'm, I'm just not uh, sophisticated enough at this point to to figure that out. Right. Well, so um, uh, for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today, I'm talking as I do each and every month with Dr. Craig Joseph. Uh, he is the chief medical officer for Nordic Consulting. We're covering the news. And uh, the other big news, I think, for uh, for the month was certainly Apple. They always have an announcement. And this time they finally came out uh, with virtual, although it's not virtual, it was a, a little bit of mix. It was a, a combination. It had some interesting features um, in, you know, um, uh, with inverted commas uh, around features. I wasn't quite sure I fully understood, but that sort of you could see the eyes routine and it was projecting um, I haven't had my hands on one. I haven't seen them except for some of the videos. I remain a little bit mm, conservative, and I'm I, I'm super geeky on all this stuff. But I, I the challenge for me is the bulkiness of these things. Um, Google Glass was the closest thing to uh, something I thought, gosh, I could wear. But of course, the battery died like in three seconds. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, they, you know, uh, Apple calls this concept spatial computing uh, because they don't want to refer to things in the metaverse um, for for obvious <laughs> shock <reasons>. horror. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you know, they they uh, introduced a, uh, um, their their first new technology in in many years called ProVision. And it comes in at the uh, version one comes in at the very affordable and reasonable price of three thousand five hundred dollars. Um, and to get that, you have to uh, you have to if you wear glasses, you have to actually send your prescription to to Apple so that they can make special inserts um, for the for the device. So you can't just take this thing and and uh, share it with a friend, I guess, um, because it, it it's kind of like a personalized experience. fully custom. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yep, yep. So yeah, people who were So have you sent out, in your prescription then? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> I have not. I like you, I'm very geeky and and uh have been uh, referred to as an Apple fanboy by uh, many people including myself. Yep. And um uh but I'm uh, 3500 does seem like a lot of money, uh especially when we realize that this is version 1 mm. and that it the price is in is definitely going to come down and um uh, we have to see, and the technology is going to get better at the same time as the price comes down. Uh, and we're going to start to see the actual applications and workflows and what would people do with this besides watch a really cool movie mm. um, or watch sports, um, which I'm told it makes it look like you're on the field of play. Uh, so um, I, I saw that video showing that years ago with hololens and i've still not seen anybody that's going woohoo i'm on the field i'm right there i i've heard some from some people who were there uh who tried it and said like it it was like nothing else and yeah but hold on a second you've got to have all the equipment to video and you know have the imagery how do you integrate that that doesn't exist that's this to me is the electric car problem there's none it's, of the inputs it's science. you don't have the charging stations it's science no you're right uh, and um again that's why uh, how many of these are they going to sell uh, is, is, the, is the question <laughs> well i dropped 1200 on the google glass i still have it if anybody wants to buy it for more i'm hoping to hang on to it when it uh, becomes highly valuable yeah <laughs> so uh, uh, i'm not dropping 3500 on one of these things no i i wouldn't either at this point however um it apparently it's put a mark in the in the sand uh where where apple has kind of i'm said, just gonna um, say so does a dog but okay 
Wow. Wow, Dr. Nick. I'm getting a lot of negativity from you. And uh, these vibes... that's not that it's not usual for me when it comes to tech. I normally jump onto these things, but maybe it's a combination of price and well, I think you know, to your point, um, what's it useful for? Is mm. gonna be the actual question, right? And and uh, and how long will it take? And uh, what are developers gonna do with it? And it's you know, it's similar to a, an iPhone. Um, when it first came out, it was a phone, uh, not even a great phone at that. Um, and all of the apps were made by Apple and, uh, you couldn't even, at least I, I think most of us couldn't even conceive of the things that, that, uh, became possible some, a bit because of the technology, a bit because of infrastructure, right? We get, we, uh, the data plans used to be very expensive. Now they're uh, very reasonable. <laughs> That's right? right. Yeah. Right. So think about that. So, so there are lots of things that we just can't even conceive of reasonably now. Um, but it seems like this is a, a, a big jump and, and the uses for healthcare um, seem like they would be, you know, tremendous. Um, and the input, the device is supposed to be, um, I've heard multiple people who are fairly cynical say the word magical. Um, that, you know, there's no device, there's no pointer, there's no mouse. Um, you look at the thing on the screen with your eyes, you just look at it and then mm. you manipulate it with your hands. And the uh, outside of the camera has something like 17 cameras. Uh, outside of the, uh, the, the device has a, 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 over a dozen cameras. I can't remember the actual number. Oh, so, it, this, so I've got to go see the teardown on iFixit. This is going to be worthwhile. I didn't know there was all that tech built oh, in as well. Yeah. Wow. So, your your hands as you're as you're grasping things and and moving things, it, they're moving on the screen. Someone mm. said it was like Minority Report, yeah, um, where you're able to kind of just uh, where we imagined we could just move slide, you know, feeling things, over, oh, yeah. make screens bigger, <clears throat> make it actually that's how it worked. And so uh, um, it's it's I think it's it's going to be revolutionary. Um, but again, it's version one. It's ridiculously expensive. And I think uh, 10 years from now, we'll look at it as a toy uh, compared to what just. Oh, what, comparatively. Yes, yeah, yeah, comparatively. So, you know, we'll see what what can we do with it from a from a healthcare perspective. All right. Um, well, you've you've pushed me a little bit further because I do like I mean, the whole minority report. I, you know, just removing the screen in my office and replacing it with this thing could potentially work if they can get the headset to sit so that it's not, you know, um, weighing my head down. I mean, I've tried a few of these things and boy, I could not tolerate it for more than five minutes before going, boy, that's a, you know, it's a strain on the neck and whatever. Yeah, it's so a, It's still heavy. Uh, the bat- There's a battery pack as well uh, that you you wear in your pocket or tucked in your, yeah. to your belt um so yeah it's not it's not a, a final thing but i think it's the uh it's the first shot across the bow and and we'll see where it goes i'm i'm excited to watch other people pay thirty five hundred dollars for yeah it. me too i'm i anybody listening that's uh got one that uh, has some experience that they'd like to share please let us know send in a a note and uh, we'd love to talk to you for sure um so uh, uh, thinking more about some of the healthcare uh, content, I think the uh, New York Times article, uh, The Moral Crisis of America's Doctors, did you see that? I did. What did you think? Um, it resonates. It resonates. It does. And it the, does. The, the concept is of, of a moral crisis is when, when folks are put in a position where they have to do things that uh, uh, either kind of rub them the wrong way um, that are not necessarily um, antithetical to their core beliefs, but kind of go against some of their core beliefs. And, and so it's uh, um, a moral crisis is not when a doctor's told, Hey, go kill that patient. Uh, that's not happening, but um, Hey, uh, this patient um, doesn't qualify. The insurance company won't pay for this patient's care um, uh, or the care that you think the patient needs because uh, they don't think the patient uh, um qualifies for it for for one of multiple reasons or or other things where they're forced to have to prioritize so which patients get which things and it puts them in a quandary and it it's uh you know the argument is that this kind of creates a, a moral crisis which leads to burnout and depression and and people uh saying you know what i can't i can't do this anymore and looking for um other things to do or retiring 
Yeah, and and anybody that listens on a regular basis knows that I've been through this and obviously have done a little bit of fighting around the denial industry that was um, relatively um, (laughs) pro-public. Nice. (laughs) Was that cool or what? That was a great great reference. Slid that in. Uh, So I've obviously seen this. You know, I've got an interesting... Uh, updated experience. I went to see a physician who takes no commercial insurance and, you know, has lots of documentation. I I gotta say, I was a little bit nervous because who knows what that means, but, you know, ultimately it came to, there was a fee that I paid at the end. I've got to go and deal with the insurance. But here was the difference between that and my regular visit to to my physician where you know i sit in the waiting room the the poor physician that i see is harried running from one place to the next does a fantastic job but in a circumstance where he's seeing more than he should be and doesn't have the time and can't really spend it because he's forced to do so because he's taking a uh, a contracted rate that is just ridiculously low for the amount of effort and time whereas this meeting for me was it was dead on time i mean literally at 9 30 was my appointment i always arrive early to everything and i think it was 9 29 i was called back uh you know really good interaction with the medical assistant um who was fantastic and then the physician came in and we had a detailed conversation. He'd reviewed all my imaging uh, that I had preloaded. He had, you know, real context. We had an extended clinical decision and reached, uh, you know, a great conclusion. And I felt, you know, personally, that experience was just super positive. And that's what the physicians want to give. So, I, you know, when you say resonate, I'm in violent agreement with this. I just, I, but I'm not seeing a solution to this. Well, the solution that many doctors have come to is the one that you're that physician, mm. which is to become a kind of a concierge, I think is the term, or direct primary care uh, uh, physician, whereby uh, they work the same way that uh, lawyers and accountants work, which is uh, by the hour or, you know, with a, uh, a set number of patients where they where often if you're going to this is going to be a long term relationship, you pay them, you pay them every month, whether you see them or not. And so they have a guaranteed income. Mm-hmm. And so hence, there are going to be some times where they're they're getting paid by you for doing nothing. And there'll be other times where you're paying them relatively little for a lot of work on their part. And it evens out over the long run. Uh, at least one hopes it does. And and yeah, short of that, I don't know, uh, uh, or just turning the entire healthcare system in the United States upside down. Uh, I'm not sure where where we go. I think Gosh, there's a really, it, uh, really well-named podcast that uh, captures that spirit, Healthcare Upside Down, by chance. <laughs> I, another amazing reference, um, just like the uh, pro-public one. <laughs> I'm on fire, as they say, or maybe I'm not. I'm just smoldering. But <laughs> um, so a little bit of time left. Um, Epic is uh, always producing this research. I think it was interesting. They transitioned from, hey, this is just the data that we're seeing, you know, correlation, causation, question mark. Um, but in one particular instance, huge deal, this one. Certainly for me, I, I uh, this was one of the things, you know, drummed into me. And I've actually done it on planes where, you know, somebody considered uh, myocardial infarction. You're, um, you know, putting aspirin and beta blockers into them uh, as quickly as possible, orally, uh, to be clear, not IV. Um, but apparently, maybe not, right? Well, they they put out a uh, uh, an interesting, you know, I, I, I hate to call it a study because, like you said, it's not... Um, it's not prospective, but, you know, they have uh, out, they have gobs of data and uh, they showed that uh, beta blocker prescriptions after an MI did not seem to decrease the rate of subsequent MIs, myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. And that's what we thought that they did do. Uh, and in fact, their data shows sometimes it might actually raise your, your, your likelihood of having another MI. There are some confounding uh, statements in there. Maybe it's because doctors really uh, put the most difficult or, or uh, sick patients on beta blockers. You know, there are lots of things that could make this uh, mm. um, not uh, accurate or, or certainly not. So not definitive that. then? Absolutely not. I don't, I don't think it's definitive, nor do they um, suggest that it is. However, 
it's interesting mm. that, that these data, which again are on millions of patients in the United States, millions um, don't show the outcome that we expect based on uh, on much more limited um, studies. And so it's certainly worthy of more conversation and, and more in-depth uh, study. And that's what they're trying to, uh, I think that's what Epic is trying to show. Yeah, fantastic. So unfortunately, as we do each and every week, uh, we've run out of time. Always a pleasure to uh, catch up with you. Um, I look forward to uh, the next discussion. We're into the summer months, so uh, perhaps a little bit slower from uh, announcements, but who knows? Chat GPT seems to be on uh, on steroids in terms of uh, activity, so don't know. Craig, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me and look forward to next month. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. 